Uh, many of us enjoy uh, what's unique about our area, the geography in particular, our inland bays, waterways. Um, but living next to those uh, fantastic areas does have a, a degree of responsibility, a stewardship. Um, I am Rick Laguerre with St. Martha's Adult Education and Community Events Committee. And uh, an awareness of our local projects and efforts uh, is important and an integral part of our, of our committee. Uh, in addition to such efforts as, as tonight, uh, we continually to continue to work with uh, other organizations and groups and welcome uh, the participation of other groups, efforts who want to get their message out to the, to the greater community. Um, this evening we'll learn about a project that is vital to our bays. I mentioned the stewardship responsibility. And that is the oyster uh, har hatchery. Uh, it's an essential stewardship item function. Uh, one of our St. Martha's community-minded uh, parishioners, over there, uh, Mimi DuPont, has been the point person in our contact with the hatchery and uh, has done a tremendous job organizing tonight. So uh, Mimi, if you could take over, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. Mimi DuPont and I am with St. Martha's as well as with the hatchery team. So um, thank you all for coming. I'm, we're really pleased that you're here and want to learn more about this. Um, at, before we get started, let's see who we have with us. If there's anybody here involved with, with government or the legislature at the state level, the county level, the local level, would you just stand up, say your name and, and your affiliation? Please, anybody? I think somebody just came in. <laughs> oh yeah, well, we're gonna take Ron's name in vain already. The poor guy just walked in the door. So, welcome, Ron. Our... Ron Green, the state rep for the 38 years. Yep. Yep, and? Retired state center. Oh, sorry. Oh. Georgetown Buddy, retired state center from the state. Yep, and? Derek Abbott here with another town councilman from South Bethany, easy down there. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your interest. Retired from the Blue Water Administration. From? She retired. Uh, she signed the role of the regulatory affairs of the Blue Water Administration. Oh, all right. Thank you all. There are so many reasons to be interested in this project. Um, I think we also, I think we also, I just wanted to see Say we have uh, Chris Basin with us tonight, and I'm going to do some introductions. But um, anybody here from an environmental uh, group interested tonight? And just stand up. Yeah. Oh, you're hooked. <laughs> Great. I'm George Lanou. I'm a member of the environmental committee at Bethany Bay. Excellent. Anybody else connected environmentally here for that? that reason? Yeah. Dennis Bartow, volunteer at the Center for Land Bay and a uh, member of the uh, uh, CAC. Citizens Advisory Committee, Inland Bays. Thank you all again for coming. Restrooms are behind you on that hall, either door. Um, in terms of oysters, which is the place to start, um, the Lewis Historical Society, thank you, um, documented that in 1781, when the state legislature was, well, might not have been called that then, but was meeting in Lewis, um, Delaware General Assembly. So this is 81. This is before we were the United States. Um, Caesar Rodney was here, and, and he noted the freshness of the sea air and the quality of the oysters. So we've been eating oysters a long time. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers tonight. Chris Basin, hand up. Yeah. yeah. Very recently retired, but still active. Um, Center for the Inland Bays. We got Ed Hale, hand up. Um, Ed's a UD Marine Advisory um, Specialist, Assistant Professor at the University of uh, Delaware, 
College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment, School of Marine Pol Science and Policy, Delaware Sea Grant. Um, he may tell you a little bit about the Sea Grant. Mark Nardi, hand up. Um, U.S. Geological Service, um, he's a geographer, and he's also an oyster farmer, so he's going to talk about the oyster farmer's view this evening. Um, also, I'd like to um, mention Steve Friend, the waterman who was going to be with us tonight. Um, he couldn't be here tonight, but he's also part of this planning team. Um, and Dennis McIntosh, uh, the U the uh, Delaware State University professor uh, could not be here either. Um, and last but not least, we have Rick Chamberlain, retired from the state police, hand up. <laughs> so we've all been working on getting more activities like this going. Um, and with that, uh, Chris Basin's going to start us off talking about um, inland bays. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Really great to see you. This is a great venue. I'm, I'm really happy to, to be able to be a part of being here, and I hope many more things happen in this really beautiful church. This is great. So, you know, we, um, we're all a, a people of the water, you know, that's why we're all living here. And we all have deep roots and connection to the water, and we've got a responsibility to take care of that, take care of our community and our coast. That's why we're all here. And the work to do that is really fascinating. It's really fun. And everybody here can make a difference. And in the, at the very least, what you can do is to buy an oyster and eat it <laughs> that was grown in the inland bays. That's literally the best thing you can do because I'm not, has, has everybody had an oyster from the inland bays? Raise your hands if you have, have had. If you have not, I'm not kidding you, I'm a little bit biased, but they are the best tasting oysters. They really are. Ed, would you agree with that? They are amazing oysters. So that's just one, one way you can help. What am I talking about? Hey. On button. Okay. Thank you. So uh, we're going to talk about oysters in the bays. We're going to talk about oyster aquaculture. Thank you for the direction. And um, at the Center for the Inland Bays, we've got an initiative to restore oysters to our waters. And most of you probably know about the Center. We're a private nonprofit organization, and we're a national estuary program. And we work with the community to bring the health of the inland bays back. And the bays are very polluted still, even to this day. They're very polluted by too much nitrogen and phosphorus. And we've lost a ton of habitat. We lost all the oysters that we have. We lost almost all of our bay grass habitat from this pollution. And bringing back the oysters is also a way to combat that pollution. So this initiative is a, a very interesting one because it has multiple parts. The thing that's missing in our bays now is the structure for the oysters to come back and set on. It used to be there was reefs all over the place and there was a big oyster trade. Even back in the 30s, like something like, you know, in 1940s, something like 30% of Rehoboth Bay was leased out to grow oysters. There was a lot of oysters being grown here, but the diseases got them. There was a couple of diseases that, that wiped them out and uh, we're trying to bring them back. So the programs that we have to do that, the first one I'm going to talk to you about is our oyster gardening program. Any oyster gardeners in the room tonight? Yes, sir. We got, we got one oyster gardener back there. So we'll, we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about our oyster shell recycling program and then our program to actually create reefs in the bays. And you'll see how these all components line up to the initiative to bring back our native oysters. These are the inland bays here. If you can see why they're so important, all those little dots are boats. All those little dots are boats in the summertime. People just love these waters. They're so productive. They support a huge horseshoe crab population, tons of migratory birds, over 100 species of fish, 40 species of felt shellfish. There's really nothing like them. And this time of year, if you get out on them, sometimes it looks like you're in Florida. You're looking at that water. It's before all the algae is growing. It's nice and clear. It's just a beautiful, beautiful bay. 
And oysters are a part of that. Oysters are basically a keystone species. With their limited biomass, they support all these other species in the bay, other crabs and fish and tunicates and invertebrates. And we need them. We need them to clean our water. So the oyster gardening program was started back in the day. This was started in 2003 as a partnership between C Grant, University of Delaware C Grant, and the center. And we wanted to know at the time, would oysters survive in these bays? And so we work with waterfront property owners to grow these oysters, these little baby oysters, to demonstrate could they survive. And in fact, they didn't just survive, they did great. Even in the places where we were kind of concerned, like you know, South Bethany canals, are, are they going to make it in there? Well, they did. They do really, really well. And then over time, the, the residents that were participating in this, they said, you know, we, we really want to get this going. We started using the baby oysters that we were growing to uh, distribute throughout the bays in the hope to bring them back, you know, sourcing these oysters throughout the bays. And over time, we did see some reproduction in the bays from this program. Right now, we've got 41 oyster gardeners, and their job is to take little baby oysters, and they put them in these uh, Taylor floats. I'll show you. That. This is a Taylor float here. here where's Fran? Where's there's Fran? This is Don Aston. That's a, all in the family there. And um, they grow them in these little floats right here, and in, in, in under a year, they have oysters that are big enough to distribute to the areas in the bays. And we're um, trying to increase the number of oyster gardeners that we have. So if you are a waterfront property owner, you know somebody that is that would like to raise these oysters, please let us know. Uh, it's just a $50 membership donation to do that. You get all the gear. We come around and take the oysters, and then we put them on our shorelines that we're trying to restore on the actual reefs themselves. So if you are interested, contact oysters at Inland Bays. Uh, but this is a crew up here from a local school district that was helping to distribute the oysters to the restoration sites. We always involve a lot of volunteers in our projects. The second program that I'd like to talk to you about is called Don't Chuck Your Shucks. Now where the oyster gardeners grow the live oysters to create the reefs, Don't Chuck Your Shucks harvest the material to create the reefs. And the thing about oysters is they build reefs, but they like to build reefs from oyster shell. When the oysters spawn and the little baby oysters go into the, war uh, the water, the larvae are floating around, they preferentially set on oyster shell. So the oyster shell in our bays right now is the missing ingredient, and that's what this program tries to fix. We have 24 restaurants that we work with where we have a shell hauler that goes around and recycles the oyster shells uh, so that they're not thrown out into a landfill. And here are some of the, the restaurants, if you can see them right over there. Uh, it's just a, a smattering of the ones that we do have, but these are the locations of them all over. Um, not only do the restaurants love to participate, they love the opportunity to educate their patrons about the good work that they're doing, and we, and we have some education about our organization through them. We started this in 2013, and we're harvesting or you know, recycling anywhere from 4,000 to 5,000 bushels a year. Um, and that's 160, 000, 160 tons a year. It's a lot of shell. This is Dave Rotondo. He was our first and long-term oyster harvester. And uh, I think this is maybe 99. This is somewhere in Bethany where he's harvesting from. But we have a truck that uh, you take them, the, the, the restaurant uh, folks in the kitchen, make sure they sort them out right, and we take them. And then we have a big pile uh, at the state park. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, we've got a lot of shell. So, the idea is we, we really want to create some big reefs, and we're going to do it. We're going to make some really big reefs. But the restaurants, they not only just, they come out and they get involved too. Like they, in the past, they've helped us bag up the shells and put them out on the reefs. And this is uh, Dogfish, Chesapeake, and Maine out on a day helping out. So we really try to involve everybody in that. So now let's talk turkey. We need to have the actual reefs to get these populations going. And to decide where we're, we were going to do these reefs, what we did is a, a, what's called a GIS analysis, Geographic Information Systems. It's a mapping software. And we selected the best spots in the bays to do that. And a couple years ago, we started with three reefs. They're what we call pilot reefs, just to test it out and see, are these things going to work? So we did uh, two in Rehoboth Bay and one in Little Assolman Bay. 
And we monitored those reefs for success, for water quality, for how much they were filtering, for how much disease were on the oysters. And we learned a lot from those three reefs. What we found is the reef that works the best was in Rehoboth Bay near the inlet. Um, the reef that didn't work very well at all was Little Asselman Bay. Just there, and the reason was there was just no um, source of living baby oysters in that area. And they were not able to reproduce themselves. But up near the inlet, there's this huge source of oyster spat, baby oysters coming through the inlet daily. And they help populate the reefs that we've put out. So we're doing two new reefs. Uh, we're going to do a half acre reef, which is a, su a substantially larger one at the James Farm Ecological Preserve in Indian River Bay uh, this year. And we're also going to try what's called an intertidal reef. Uh, this is one that is sometimes exposed when the tide is low and sometimes underwater when the tide is high. And if you've ever been down to Chincoteague, you see that they have a lot of oyster reefs like that down there. So I think I maybe forgot to mention this in my talk, but oysters um, are able to filter nitrogen out of the water. We've got so much nitrogen in the water, and that's one special thing that they do, is they filter it as they feed, and there's a microbial process that happens below that oyster that actually takes <coughs> it out of the water altogether. So after we do these next two reefs, we're going to do another round of planning, where we're going to site even more and larger reefs to use all that shell that we got there, and it's an iterative learning process, but eventually we will have self-sustaining populations of oysters in the bays. And my lead in here is that aquaculture is a big part of that. Aquaculture plays a big role in that. And that was one of the first things that we did when I came on board the center is said, we got to get aquaculture going in the bays. And we had a lot of help and we were able to work with the legislature to pass a law to do that. And now we've got people outgrowing oysters in the bays and we think that we can work with the growers, you know, people like Mark and, and others, to help support the restoration of the wild oyster in the bays. So this is what some of the reef creation looks like. This is a, the barge that has the shell on it. We use some concrete blocks to help prop up the oysters off the bottom. And we use a, a bunch of volunteers to help us along the way. This is, uh, I think this is the reef in Little Asselman Bay, just kind of showing the size of these small reefs that we first created. Okay. So transitioning into aquaculture, and you know, before I do that, does anybody have any questions about the programs I've talked about so far? I'll just take a pause here and see if anybody has any questions. Yes, Rich. Where are you putting the intertidal reef? Um, it's going to be on the west side of the barrier island, just south of the inland. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty out of the way. We try to we try to make sure that they're they're. I'm not they're about that. Yeah, uh, you can't eat them though, Rich. I know <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, are, are the reefs just oysters, uh, oyster shells, or, or is there some kind of lattice work that holds them together? Or how, how does that work? Yeah, the oyster shell, without something to hold them down, will spill out and move all with the currents and the tide, and that was something that we learned from the Rehoboth Bay sites. So we've developed a burlap bag method to put over them and hold them down, and it's, uh, we, we actually call it an oyster burrito because we'll wrap the shells in the burlap to keep them in place, and it looks like a burrito. But um, that's something we learned is that you, you got to work with the energy in the bay. Yes, sir. On uh, a massive landing area, quite a bit of water that moves through there. Is that a good place to put a reef? Probably not because I think it's probably prohibited shellfish harvest area, and the state wants us to stay away from those areas that are prohibited under the thinking that if we create a reef out there, and somebody sneaks out in the middle of the night and eats an oyster that is maybe contaminated, that that could cause problems with the industry, which makes sense. So we, we try to keep it in the areas that are, that you can actually eat the oysters, although we don't want to eat the oysters. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was just curious if, you know, it sounds somewhat um, similar to what the Chesapeake Bay Foundation is doing, and they seem to be a much larger, well-funded organization. Are, is there any sharing of best practices between two organizations? Yep, that is an excellent question. I, and I'll answer it and then I'm gonna move on a little bit here. But um, yes, and, uh, we have a scientist on staff, Andrew McGowan, who's worked with them pretty extensively on how to do the reef creation and really stepping it in slowly to figure out what works. And that was their advice. They said, you guys gotta figure out what works in your bays to, to, try, to, to try to figure out how to go big. Um, 
So yeah, they're, they're a great resource for us. So uh, I want to talk about aquaculture in Delaware. Um, there, there's a few aquaculture producers in Delaware, but it's, it's mostly fin fish, like tilapia, and striped bass, um, hybrid striped bass. And up into 2013, we were the only state that didn't have any shellfish aquaculture. It was prohibited. And it goes back to this, this story that back in the day, and George probably can tell this better than I can, but when the oyster diseases uh, wiped out the oysters in the inland bays, the leases remained. And a few of the lease owners decided they were going to abuse that lease system, and they started harvesting all the clams in the leases, which was complete, if it wasn't illegal, it was immoral. And boy, did that make the Department of Natural Resources mad. <laughs> And it was like a big thing. And they said, there will never be any more harvesting of oysters ever again. And they abolished all the leases. And this was like in the 70s or something. And um, that's why it took so long for it to come back. There was a huge resistance from the Department of Natural Resources. But it was able to be overcome. The legislation got passed. And in 2017, the first uh, lottery for the shellfish development areas happened. And in 2018, the first commercial sale of aquaculture was held, and the, the oysters are great. So now we've got about 10 to 20 individuals or corporations that are involved with aquaculture so far. And in the last report from 2020, there were 43 acres. We had 14 leases and 727,000 oysters planted. So it's really gaining steam. It's really going. Um, we talked a bit about the, the nutrient removal benefits of aquaculture. Uh, every oyster that you pull out of the water is pulling nitrogen and phosphorus out, right? So that's, that's leaving the system. So it's actually harvesting the nutrients out of the system. Nutrients are pollution to the bays, but are they bad when you, you and I eat them? No, they're good. The nitrogen and phosphorus is good for us. Um, oyster reefs also produce all this habitat, all these different fish and all these other species. They love these reefs. So aquaculture is, is good that way as well. Economic benefits in uh, U.S. production was $1.5 billion in 2018. 41% of that was from Atlantic Coast states, and oysters are the most profitable species. Right now, the most profitable species in um, Delaware harvested is the blue crab, but I think someday the oysters will surpass that. Uh, New Jersey's got a great industry going, and they're, they're, they're worth about $1.37 right now, $1 million dollars. And if you look at Rhode Island, they have 339 acres. That's pretty close to the number of acres that we have potential in the inland bays under shellfish aquaculture development areas, right? And Rhode Island's got a $6 million industry. So give you an idea of about how big the Delaware industry could be. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Ed, who is the expert in aquaculture and has been doing some really fantastic work. I'd like to thank uh, St. Martha's and Mimi and Rick and my guest speakers uh, for all being here and making this happen. It's pretty cool, pretty exciting. Um, I work with Dennis McIntosh a lot, who unfortunately couldn't be here. He is an aquaculturist or an aquaculture professor up at Dell State, and we typically talk to groups less than four or five people. So <laughs> we're happy to see all of you in the room. Um, I have been spreading this gospel about the good news of oyster aquaculture for some time. And I'm really happy to kind of do it on a bigger scale. So I, as uh, Mimi indicated, am a marine advisory specialist with Delaware Sea Grant. And so I work with that institution, which is um, an education outreach arm of the university. I also have a faculty appointment with the School of Marine Science and Policy. I work on a number of different projects uh, associated with fisheries and aquaculture extension. Uh, Apex Predators, Atlantic Sturgeon, American Shad, River Herring up in Brandywine, dam removal issues, blue crabs in the Indian River Bay, and oyster aquaculture. So, pretty active uh, research, research portfolio, uh, but we're here today to talk about um, oysters, of course. And so, for this, it's really pretty neat. As Chris had mentioned, <coughs> pretty cool intersection between ecology and economy. Oyster farming is actually a relatively highly green practice, right? It's something that we want to think about 
talk about agricultural <laughs> farming and terrestrial landscapes, it requires an input of nutrient uh, enrichment, right? Nitrogen and phosphorus, the very things that oysters take out. In addition, oyster farming also provides habitat. This includes shellfish farming, not just oyster reefs. The very farms that these folks go out and work will help uh, provide habitat, will help increase biodiversity, and in help increase biomass of things like blue crabs, of things like talatog, of things like black sea bass, things that we all want to go recreationally fish for. So I like to kind of bring that up and reiterate it. Helpful to point out, so we saw some case studies about the overall economic worth of this industry to other states. Up until now, Delaware was one of the last states to not have an oyster hatchery. Forty-some oyster hatcheries along the eastern seaboard, six in the state of Maryland alone, zero in the state of Delaware, which means the folks that in our state that want to buy oysters have to work with out-of-state oyster hatcheries. And so they're effectively having to compete for similar resources. That is why we decided that it's time to build an oyster hatchery, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, before I do that, back to the economics. $16.9 billion trade deficit in seafood in this country. $16.9 billion trade deficit in this country in 2019 alone. Oysters, previously in the early 1800s, landed by 2 million bushels. Current wild harvest quotas at 14,000 bushels. Bushels roughly 200 individual oysters. We have a lot of room for growth. Okay, and I'm going to show you that. Oops. All right, so the status of our current shellfish aquaculture industry. Within the inland bays, we have 13 commercial leases and one scientific lease as of 2020. Um, within Delaware Bay, which I'm going to talk about, we have 11 commercial leases for wild harvest. Okay, and we potentially have four aquaculture farmers that I am working with at present. I should probably go back and show some pictures. <coughs> So this individual's name is uh, Chris Redifer. He was our first individual to actually sell a commercially sourced uh, aquaculture oyster. We prohibited oyster aquaculture in the inland bays in 1979 uh, for some reasons that we we previously talked about. Um, and so we ended that activity. Flash forward to 2013, we reinvigorated our oyster aquaculture industry. 2017, first oyster lottery. 2018, first commercial sale to give you an idea. So temporarily, we are making you know, relatively rapid advancements, having an industry of about 13 individuals. We have one oyster nursery that's run by Mark Casey, individual <laughs> right over here, um, who's growing oysters in Indian River. And this is my colleague, Dennis McIntosh. We routinely host shellfish forums and meetings for the Delaware Aquaculture Association so that they can get together and essentially learn things that they want to learn and communicate as a group also started to engage in remote setting practice where we take oyster larvae, adhere them to shell. So as Chris mentioned, the larvae are actually pelagic for a short period where they drift in the water column 24 to 36 hours. Then they actually go down and adhere to a shell. The difference between Delaware Bay and the inland bays is that in Delaware Bay, we do oyster aquaculture on a much larger numeric scale. And in the inland bays, we're conducting growing seed oysters, so individuals that are not part of a cluster and instead are individuals. All right, and this picture, if you're not familiar, is from an active lease site in, I think, Sally's Cove? Yep, Sally's Cove. So Rehoboth Bay, if you haven't seen it yet. All right, this is our map of potential, okay? We saw what Rhode Island is able to produce with roughly 393 acres. We have 343 um, what are called shellfish aquaculture development areas that are pre-permitted areas for oyster aquaculture and hard clam aquaculture in the inland bays. Within Delaware Bay, we have almost 6,000 acres of available habitat of which approximately one-third currently contains aquaculture sourced oyster larvae. We have a lot of room to grow. And this is kind of where, where I see a lot of potential for development and investment. So. The red was feasible spots to grow oysters? Or no, the red is actually, that is actually a, a no-take uh, area associated with. Uh, uh, I was talking about the middle map and the side map. That's all of the red areas are no-take 
uh, exclusion areas. Oh, okay. Yep, yeah, so that is where you cannot have oysters. A lot of them are associated with um, wastewater treatment facilities, and it's not that we're dumping anything into the water, it's a potential envelope of water in case a spill happens. So it's really important to think about things. We talk about pollution, we're talking about nutrients, right? Nitrogen and phosphorus that we use for terrestrial farming practices that get into the water. And when we talk about these red exclusionary areas, they're for human safety, health, and concerns. Denerec is actively testing these according to FDA protocols, and if we have any issues, we deal with them immediately. So that's happening. So I don't want to scare anybody. Okay. I have been working with industry since 2019 to try and do some remote setting. We have had a great amount of difficulty acquiring oyster larvae from private hatcheries. Um, unfortunately, because of the salinity of our location and some of the other physical habitat characteristics, and simply the fact that we are an out-of-state entity trying to buy a, a limited source product. So, we have decided to step up and construct a pilot scale oyster hatchery uh, on the Broadkill River at the University of Delaware's Hugh R. Sharp, Hugh R. Sharp campus. This is within the College for Earth, Ocean, and Environment. It's uh, interesting to note that there was actually some shellfish aquaculture occurring in what would uh, be a, a modified garage. Um, but we have a cool access to the waterway and a decent site to do this. And so we experience salinities between five and 28 parts per thousand. Um, optimal oyster survival is actually between 12 and 28 parts per thousand. So we know that we have some of the physical habitat characteristics that oyster larvae really like. This is the site of our future hatchery, at least our pilot scale hatchery. It's relatively small. These are some folks uh, from nationwide from, well, not nationwide, the Mid-Atlantic region. This is my colleague, Dennis McIntosh, discussing our plan for this hatchery and what we think we're going to do. You got that? Who's, who's ringing? <laughs> cool, I like it. We can have a soundtrack. <laughs> All right, so here's our uh, flow diagram. So if we take a look at this last picture, right, what I'm gonna show you is essentially a flow diagram. You can see this bulkhead here, okay? That's gonna be our green boundary layer here. So this is the bulkhead. The remote set tanks, the ones that you saw pictures of the oyster bags inside of, are going to be off to the left side. Each one of them is capable of housing between 600 and 700 bushel bags. Each bushel bag contains approximately 200 oyster shells. I wanna put a lot of oyster larvae on those shells and then deploy that into Delaware Bay and into the inland bays with the help of ecological restoration practitioners. Fancy terms for people who want to help restore wild habitat. This is not an exclusion to industry. We want to partner with both. That's the goal, to serve both industry and nonprofit groups so that we can help improve Delaware's waterways. When we look at our flow diagram, after we bifurcate the raw water that we're going to send to these remote set tanks, we're going to actually engage in a series of uh, filtration steps. We've talked to a few people at private hatcheries in the state of Maryland, a few people at public hatcheries in the state of Virginia and uh, New Jersey, and so we think that we have a, a fairly well outlined for how we can do this in terms of managing water, polishing it, and producing some high quality larvae. The larvae can then be grown into seed oysters for supplying our industry in the inland bays. Our expected hatchery output, so we can actually develop production curves. It's an attempt. We are trying to forecast what we're capable of doing. This is a pilot scale facility. We know it's small, but we think we have the potential to grow between 50 and 75 million eyed oyster larvae. Sounds like a lot until you look at Chesapeake Bay Foundation, which is producing, you know, hundreds of millions to a billion. Relatively small. Stage two, we're hopeful within three years, we'll be able to produce the same number of eyed larvae, but also five million seed oysters. Our intent is to grow in parallel with industry so that we can become a supplier. That is the goal. We want to enhance economic opportunity and you know, affect the trade deficit on, on a bigger scale. So that's the goal here. Unfortunately, we are a bit limited by space and projected production <coughs> estimates likely represent a maximum. So this is what we think maximum we can produce. Hatcheries, running a hatchery is a delicate business. Right? Failure is quite, quite commonly an option. 
despite what people want to think about it. So how do you leverage existing research efforts within the state at two universities between Dennis and I, Delaware State University and University of Delaware, and try and do this on a bigger scale, as well as innovate for new future product growth. I read an article today about an individual in Scandinavia growing ulva, sea lettuce. High protein consumption, right? Talk about marine algaes, they grow sugar kelp in New England. Why can't we grow marine algae in the mid-Atlantic? We don't have a facility to test these types of applications. So, we think we have the potential here to leverage existing grant opportunities through three folks that are doing a number of projects presently. So what we think we can do is actually build something called a Fisheries and Aquaculture Innovation Center. This is a pie in the sky idea, but we think that we can really land um, a, and grow with the industry to essentially implement um, a more strategic vision to help both industry and ecological restoration. And so this is kind of what we think we can do. We think with a larger uh, mixed agency facility, we could potentially target 500 million eyed larvae, perhaps 20 million seed oysters, and 10 million hard clams. We think that we could be able to do this within a five to 10 year period. In addition, we'd like to host a recirculating aquaculture system for freshwater applications. There's been a number of research studies that are examining hybrid striped bass, striped bass, and Atlantic salmon. For those of you who are unaware, Scandinavian outfits are building salmon farms all up and down I-95. Blue Sapphire is a company that exists outside of Miami, right in a major transportation corridor in Florida. They are building two more Atlantic salmon recirculating aquaculture facilities in Maine, and one is planned for the eastern shore of Maryland. This presents a unique opportunity for growth. This also presents challenges in that nobody really knows how to grow these things you know, outside of the Scandinavian outfits that are importing their knowledge. So we want to try and be ready to leverage existing expertise. Just turns out that Dennis McIntosh has a formal background in recirculating aquaculture systems. In addition to this, we would like to partner with ecophysiological research to examine species like tuna and sharks. We know the populations of apex predators are changing, complements of management. If you walk from Anglers Marina to Irish Eyes, you will notice that just about every boat has an advertisement for shark fishing. We think this has a significant economic opportunity, and we do not understand some of the implications that are going on here. So one of my research partners actually studies these animals. So we think between the three of us, we can generate enough research funding to essentially demonstrate a high level of significance and need for this type of facility. In addition, we think that we can potentially augment wild harvest and enhance oyster production in the Inland Bays and Delaware Bay. So that's what we're trying to go after. This kind of aligns with UD's strategic plan. We've identified this in terms of entrepreneurship. We know that we are potentially enhancing that innovation if we can target that type of growth. So that's the goal. All right, I present to you um, an example. This is Delaware State's facility up in Dover. This is a current recirculating aquaculture system. Right now, it has multiple production technologies. We understand, unfortunately, that this particular uh, building may be marked um, for other activities and uh, no longer engage in aquaculture. So we're very much trying to bridge a gap between Delaware State University and the University of Delaware to accomplish some bigger goals. All right, with that, I will leave you with industry perspective um, so that you can get some feedback on some limitations as well as how oysters are grown. Well, I've been given a couple of tough acts to follow. So, uh, my name is Mark Marty. I'm a, I'm a grower of uh, oysters in the Hobart Bay. Uh, my day job is a geographer with the U.S. Geological Survey. So, just the disclaimer is anything I say today is my own personal feelings and not that of the federal government, the United States federal government. So, just in case. Um, so, a um, couple other things. One is I'm a little horse. I've got a, a young Chesapeake Bay dog that I've been training. and. And we're having a bit of a power struggle that I'm losing. Um, she, like, she likes squirrels better than the whistle, so you know that's my boy. So that's 
a little horse today. And then the third thing is, as I go along, please feel free to ask questions, you know, pipe up anytime. If I, if I skip over something you think is interesting or you want to hear more about, just, you know, let me know. Just raise your hand, and if I don't see it, just holler at me. So the, what we're doing is there's a number of farms, uh, two farms right now, that are trying to put together a brand that we call Arrowhead Point Oysters. Um, the reason we call it Arrowhead Point Oysters is because we grow in an area called Sally's Cove, which is uh, very close to um, Camp Arrowhead. And the, and the little spit of land there is actually called Arrowhead Point. So that's where, the, that's where kind of the name comes from. Um, you can find our product in local restaurants, or if you search us on Facebook, you can find us. Um, Hickman's Meat Market also carries our oysters, so there's, there's a number of places where you can get, get them. Okay, so the model that we're kind of looking at is almost like other large integrators of other food integrators, but hopefully a lot more fair and a lot cleaner than some uh, activities that I, I won't mention, that, but we all know what they are. And they all, they, they produce um, uh, a serious economic impact, beneficial impact to the state of Delaware and the region, um, but sometimes they're seen as a little kind of environmentally unfriendly or perhaps a little, a little hard on their growers. So, but, but they've got a great model and they've been extremely successful in the way that they've, they've employed that model. And one of the things that we've kind of noticed as we've gone along is to have this industry really work in, in this state, we're gonna need a certain critical mass. Um, and in that critical mass, there needs to be um, understandable and, and, and brands that people recognize and are willing to continue to go back to because they know, like when they buy a Purdue chicken, that, that the quality is going to be there. It's going to be of a certain, a certain taste and flavor and certain fat content. You know what you're getting, and you know that you, you see the price and you say, okay, well, I know that that's worth the money that I'm paying. So that's kind of the, the, the model, if you will, that we're looking at doing. Um, the problem is going to be finding enough growers to feed that. So the idea is that, that Arrowhead Point will market your oysters if you're Joe Grower. We'll, we'll contract with you to, to buy your oysters at we, what we agree to be a fair price. You'll grow them to our standards, and then we'll move them along through the market. Um, one of the most important things, frankly, uh, to, and I'll talk about this a little later, is the marketing aspect of it. So what is oyster farming? Um, you know, we've talked a bit about that. Basically, it's taking oyster, what we call oyster seed, which are very small oysters. Generally, when we plant them, we look for six to eight millimeters. Um, and those seed are produced in, uh, in a hatchery. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but you did a great job on that. Um, and then, you know, we, we put them in the water and we practice husbandry with these animals. They're animals and they require husbandry. And it's, it's good, clean, hard work. Uh, okay, it's hard work and it's not clean. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it does have an, an excellent outcome. It's got an excellent outcome for the things that we've been talking about, right? Um, we can produce it, we can produce income, we can produce economic benefit to the state of Delaware, and all the while doing that, we can produce a great product that people love, and oh, by the way, we've also got a, a serious uh, positive environmental impact. So, uh, the real quick kind of how, did, how does it happen sort of thing, um, Ed talked about the, grow, the, uh, the hatchery process, um, and, and it is a bottleneck right now. I spent a couple hours on the phone the other day looking for oyster seed. Um, Mark Casey over there um, runs, a, runs a, a nursery, uh, but, but I think that the customer base hasn't been really there. There hasn't been enough people buying his, his grown out seed from the nursery to really keep him in business where he can make money and, and continue to be profitable. So we bought seed from Mark and we had an excellent, excellent experience with the seed, but it, it's not there as, as, you know, because because the, the demand isn't there, basically is what it boils down to. So this goes back to that critical mass. There are certain things that need to happen in the industry uh, to make it a viable industry, right? There's gotta be the growers, there's gotta be shippers, there's gotta be the labs that create, that create the seed, there's gotta be the guys like Mark who, who raised the seed up in a nursery to the, the point where a guy like me wants to buy it and put it out. So, as we say, you know, pure sor sorcery, I call it science, some people call it sorcery. Um, depends on your point of view. Um, but, uh, so, so they're hatched, the, the larvae are tricked into, or I'm sorry, the oysters are tricked, manipulated, and feeling romantic. Uh, you know, we get, we get progenesis, uh, I get some new baby oysters, they get set on very small pieces of carbonate because 
as, as was said before, oysters like other oysters to set on. Um, they like carbonate things. Um, and, then, and then they go to the nursery where Mark would come in. And he, he, he kind of grows, uh, grows those little oysters up to the point where they can go out in bags. And, and it uh, can actually happen pretty quickly. So, uh, what did you say? You want to guess that? <laughs> So once they once they come to us from from say Mark Casey's uh, nursery, we'll uh, or if they don't come from Mark Casey's nursery, we have to import them from out of state, which means that we have to have a pathology report. There's some some requirements that Denrec has put in place to safeguard the industry and our and our oyster, oyster population, and um, and then we kind of go through the process of growing them. So we plant them in bags. Um, we do some splitting of those bags as they grow up. Oysters want they want to be able to breathe like every 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 other organism, you know, wants to respire. But they also want they also need to, to, to eat, right? So and if you have too many in a bag, they get kind of all jammed up, they grow into each other, you get oysters that are five in a big glob. And not only that, but they aren't able to feed the way that they need to, so they don't grow as quickly as in, in what, what you might call an optimal growth. So they're gonna be out in the water longer. And um, kind of in this in this whole litany of list of things that we're doing. Um, everything, everything requires handling of that oyster. So back in the day, I used to I used to have an alfalfa business, and I said to myself, every time I pick up that bale of hay, I was doing small square bales, never again. Um, it, it's going to cost me twenty five cents, right? Every time I touch that hay, it takes input from me, it takes effort, and it's the exact same thing with five million oysters, right? You're going through each and one of those, each just about each and every one of those oysters and sorting it. You're deciding. Is it a good size? Is it a good marketable oyster? Is it too big? Is, is the half shell market gonna like this? Because the half shell market is where the premium pricing is. And it's very picky because, I mean, you go to a restaurant and somebody charges you $3 for an oyster, you want a good oyster. There's no question about it. Um, so it takes a lot, of, a lot of time on the grower side. So it, it's, it's husbandry, you know, kind of on steroids in a lot of ways. Um, right, so we talked a lot about this. Chris talked about it. I think he covered this pretty well. Um, there are a number of ways that we grow oysters. Oops, sorry, is that good? Um, the way that we grow oysters is we have what we call a flip bag method. Uh, we have bags, we have these bags here that are sitting on a boat. And if you can imagine a long clothesline, and when the tide goes out, the bags flip down. Uh, they're, they're hung on the bags on the line with long line clips, just like a long line fisherman does with his hooks. And then when the tide comes in, the bag flips up. The idea is that those oysters are continually moving in that bag at some level, so that helps shape the oyster into a deeper cup, which is what the half shell market wants, a deeper cupped organism. And then also, hopefully, if things work right, those bags will have some time to desiccate or dry on the line to reduce biofouling, which will reduce our, our input of costs, which is the highest, highest cost input in this whole deal is labor. So what we're always striving to do is reduce labor. Um, so we'll, we'll grow them out in bags, in these flip bags, and from the time we plant an eight millimeter oyster to the time it's harvested, um, which would be a minimum of three inches is what we like to go for, could be anywhere from eight to 14 months, depending on, uh, on, on the genetics of the, of the creature, um, as well as uh, water temperature. Water temperature really has a lot to do with how quickly they grow. Hmm. Any questions so far? What's the optimum temperature? I'm going to ask a scientist. I mean, the it's almost growth is a function of temperature, and so is feeding rate. And so the warmer it is, the more they feed, the quicker they grow. Mm -hmm. But that's not always the best case scenario when the farmer wants a spe specific product in terms of shelf width, depth. So you want to actually slow growth down a little bit. But definitely growth window, um, I think it's over 45 degrees, they begin to start feeding again. So, so over what temperature will they die? <coughs> is, there, uh, is there a maximum? Probably in the high 90s, mid to high 90s I mean, somewhere. Yeah, they, they can sit out in, in 90 degree atmospheric temperature, so I wouldn't be surprised. So Ed brings up a good, a good point, though. If you grow the oyster out too quickly, it'll have a brittle soft shell. We find that, that oysters that have overwintered, uh, much easier to shuck, much heavier, much heavier shell. Kind of, it's, it's much more pleasing for the person in the restaurant, the shucker, who's actually got to do the work. And, pardon me? No, I was saying cooler temperatures. 
Uh, so the, the flavor comes a lot from, there's a term in the wine, in the wine industry called terroir, terroir um, right? And so that's been adopted by, uh, kind of adopted and switched up by the oyster industry and we call it terroir. So where they're grown has a lot to do with the flavor. In, in Rehoboth Bay, they're, they're, they're a briny oyster, but they've got kind of a sweet, almost licorice-y finish at the end. Uh, which is kind of interesting. If you go up Chesapeake Bay, where the Susquehanna River inflows have a much much greater influence on water quality and water salinity, you'll get a much a much less briny oyster, and so and they tend to be kind of maybe a little more metallic tasting, uh, but but a totally different flavor profile. And and that's a really good point. A lot of branding is kind of built on that flavoring. So you know <coughs> you've heard of Blue Points, you've heard of Cherry Points, um, you know all the famous kind of New England oysters. Those are all, those are places. They're not necessarily, a, they're, they're, they're all the same Virginicus oyster, Virginianus oyster, uh, the same species of oyster, but it's just where they're grown. And also how they're grown can also have some impact on, on the flavor. What we, what we have actually found is that on the west side of the bay in Sally's Cove, it's not quite as salty, and what we do is we take our oysters across the bay. Uh, the state requires that they be submerged um, at a, at a depth of about three feet for 21 days uh, before going to market, and it's saltier over there, and they actually salt up. And that's something that was done on the, on the Chesapeake Bay from the Chesapeake side to Chincoteague side back in the day. They used to salt, they called it salting oysters, and they'd bring oysters from the Chesapeake side and put them in these big big beds that were kind of above in the intertidal zone, these big trays, and they'd let them salt up for a week or two and then send them off to market as Chincoteague salts. Yes, sir. So for the decoration process, do you take the bags, put them in the cages after you move them across the bed? Yeah, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll take these bags, we'll take these floats off, and then we've got bottom cages, and we have another, another boat that's got a small data crane on it. So we'll pull those up, and we've got like little, what we call oyster condos. So they'll hold four bags, we'll put four bags in there, and then depurate them for and 21 days across the bed. cages sit in another um, uh, bed, so to speak. That's yeah. the lease? Yes, they're on another leased acre across the bay. Yep, exactly right. Yeah. right. Yes, ma'am. You know, going through your 20 day period there, what kind of maintenance do you need to do on the oysters at that point? So, on the last 21 days, we, we put them on the bottom and we leave them. Just remember to pick them up after 21 days or as the market needs. So, yes. Yes, sir. Question. Uh, earlier on, Chris and uh, Ed, Ed had mentioned the disease in the water. Um, was the death of the oyster population locally sufficient enough to remove that, or is that still a threat to your industry? No, Dermo and MSX and other threat. diseases are still they're still the threat. In the Bay, I know they've worked to, to, to try and get, find seed that are more resistant. That's exactly right. We we do buy. Yeah, go ahead. You speak up. Yeah. Yeah, so I just want to clarify for the room, the diseases that we're talking about are associated with oysters. It's not potentially contaminating yeah, right. the human. Us, yeah. right? So it's a oyster MSX and dermo crippling to oyster populations beginning in the 1950s. Um, we had a dermo outbreak documented in Delaware Bay, I think it started in 1957 or 1959, um, MSX, excuse me, and we had dermo in the 1990s, decimated Delaware Bay wild populations, right? So it's another area where we have to continually be monitoring. Mark's talking about Denerac doing testing, and they do. When we import from out of state, when any shellfish gets imported from out of state, we have to do some level of disease testing for oyster diseases. But these are not transferable to humans, and it's, it's not an issue. It's more a function of we just don't want to disrupt sure. uh, what we have going on. Yeah, I, 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 I recognize that they're not toxic to humans. But sure. Right. So yeah, so the pathology reports, every time we import oysters, baby oysters, we have to get a pathology report submitted to DENREC within, I forget how many days, Mark? Two weeks or so, it's two weeks. Days. We've got 14 days to turn them around and get the oysters back in the state. So, so if we wanted to sample some of these delicious oysters, yes, the restaurant groups or restaurant tours in this locale are your most consistent clients? Um, so, Sodell. Sodell. Sodell buys a bunch of them, yeah. The Wheelhouse in Lewis buys some as well. Yes, sir. In the are very these, back. Are these the bags that you eventually tag and then ship to restaurants? Or is this, or do, they, do they come out of these bags? They'll come out of those bags. They'll get cleaned on the boat. They'll get washed on the boat. Kind of low pressure, high volume wash is what we do. 
Um, and then they'll get sorted and counted once again into bags that will be tagged with a harvest tag, put on ice, and then on to the restaurant. Yes, sir. How much interaction during the husbandry period do you have, you know, when you're working with the oysters and you're growing them? How often do you flip them over? You know, the, the way that we're doing things, we handle an oyster about five times during its lifetime. About the, yeah, maybe six, depending, yeah. What, what did you find, Mark? What do you I'm find? 13. You're 13? Okay. Uh, we're, we're not good parents. <laughs> Benign neglect. Uh, yeah. How about like storm prep or something like that? That, that could be a real disaster. That could be a real disaster. Um, if you don't do it, you, we can, we, you know, we could lose a whole harvest. Right. We, we could lose a lot of gear. And the, and the problem is we don't just lose the gear, we have to go find it because Right, it's, it's a lot of stuff that's gonna end up in somebody's yard, depending on how bad the storm is. And uh, so, you know, we've spent a fair amount of time looking for gear and, and people are great about the tag bags. They'll call us and, you know, we'll always bring a bag of oysters and get our, get our bag back and get our gear back. Do you have enough depth in the water in the, in the bag to get them down the bottom? Um, so in, in that area, we have enough to sink them as far as we probably need to if, if the, the, the storm's sure. coming. The worst storms are in Sally's Cove, or the, is the wind out of the uh, south southeast. That's where you get a lot of fetch and a lot of wave action. Coming out there. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> yes, sir. Can you explain how you determine which water is safe for these in for human consumption versus growing them just to, for the purpose of cleaning up the water? Right. So, so Denric does that. They do they do regular testing of the waters for bacteria, um, and then they've determined over the course of many years uh, which areas are safe and which aren't safe for human consumption. So which are open shellfish areas and which aren't? And um, you showed that in yours, so the red areas, I don't want to go all the way back, but, but there are maps out there that show. And all the least acres are in open areas. There are some that might flip, like if you go way up Indian River, there are some acres that are for lease that nobody's touched yet because frankly, they're a little worried that that maybe one day will flip the other way where, where it might close for, uh, for shellfish. Mark, you were gonna say something? Yeah, just the, the gentleman here in the front brought up the, the statement about the Chris showed you a pile of shells. That pile of shells has to dry for a year before it can go into the water. Oh. Right. And I just That's don't want anybody to leave thinking that putting shell in the water is a good idea. Because if you go to the store and you buy oysters from Washington or somewhere else, you come home and you shuck those oysters, you eat them, and you put them in our bay, you will put diseases from those other places in our bay. So, we want the shells to be dried, we want to get the shells in the water, but we don't want to bring disease. So if you decide you want to put shell out of the water, please make sure it's dry and dead for a year before you do that. So it's just a, a safety concern that you could walk out of your window. Right, or, or invasive species as well. You never know what little eggs are, are you know, on there, so. Yes, sir? When uh, we pile the oysters, uh, we have a lot of flies that come in there, beetle larvae, that they eat all the flesh off of those shells in that curing process. Right. So that removes a lot of that. Right, and, and the key is the curing process, right? You're, you're really curing them is what you're doing. You're, you're curing with the heat of the sun and the dryness of the air as well as whatever bugs come along and, and kind of clean up the shell. Yes, sir? Back to what Chris said earlier, uh, one of the things you can do, or maybe the only thing you can do, and the only, I'm sure the only thing I can do to help this process, because I'm not a farmer, I, I, you know, I'm just not involved. I, I can go to a restaurant and eat oysters. Yes, sir. And my concern is, how do I know they're okay, you know? Repeat the question, Mark? How does, he know, how does he know an oyster served in a restaurant is okay? Um, and, and Ed's volunteered to take it, so. <laughs> Yeah, just talk loud. Yeah. Um, so the FDA, we, FDA, we're, we're the guy that right here, right front. Yes, that's right. Um, so the FDA does food safety tests. These guys have uh, essentially Vibrio control plans to monitor for Vibrio bacteria. And they have refrigeration schedules, icing baths, protocols that they have to undergo for safety constraints. Anybody that gets sick and reports any type of issue associated with an illness that goes to a hospital is then able to be traced back through a series of forms and paperwork that they have to submit 
And so we know that there's a line of traceability associated with oyster harvest in a restaurant. And anything that's considered direct has the same capability. So um, anybody that's able to sell to you has to be a, a state certified dealer. So I would rest assured, in fact, I would encourage you when you go to a restaurant to ask specifically for a Delaware-based sourced product. Um, local seafood is, is, is often just enhancing you know, economic benefit generated within the state. With that, I think Mark has a couple of slides left, then we can take more questions. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm never okay. to that. <laughs> Do you have anything to add to that, Mark? I know you feel strongly about it. An oyster should never smell, is the simple answer. <laughs> 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 you nose, you'll know. <laughs> so we're, we're getting towards the end here. So what in the state of Delaware, what, what, what are these barriers, what are the problems kind of from the, the individual growers to the macro scale that we've got going on? So it costs a lot of money to get into oyster farming. You know, if you go out and you, you don't have a boat, you've got nothing, you're looking at somewhere between thirty-five and fifty thousand dollars to to get rolling. Is 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 that about what you think, Mark? Is that it's probably higher. Okay. Yeah. So it depends on how small you can go. And right. currently we can't go small. Right. So and, and, and he's referring to uh, to Denrec regulations that we've got that we're working through. So speaking of Denrec, Denrec has been once, once we got the conservative state of Delaware, which is surprisingly conservative in a lot of ways, kind of off its mark, and we got the industry started, denrec has been really great about the permitting process, uh, helping, helping growers work through the different levels of permit, permitting that are required, and there's a state level uh, with DENREC, there's, there's a couple federal levels, one with the Army Corps of Engineers, Coast Guard comes into it, but for the grower, DENREC is a one-stop shop for that. In other states, it, it takes a grower, they've basically got to get a law degree and, and be able to read Latin to, to understand what they need to do to get through the permit process. So I'd, I'd like to, to you know thank DENREC for that. Um, there are some, some current regulation issues that we're working through with DENREC that I would call growing issues as the industry grows. De um, regulations will, pro will promulgate it kind of in a, in a knowledge vacuum. And now that we've had three, four, or five years of growing under our belts, we kind of know where the regulations need to be adjusted, and, and we're trying to work, and we're working with DENREC to do that so that we can maintain a viable industry. Uh, because obviously without growers, and growers that can make a profit, it's, it's just not going to work. Yes, sir? So uh, should I infer that DENREC is the authority for determining when and where leases exist, and yep. what process do they use? Yes, they are. They are the authority, yes. You, 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 the follow-on was what process do they use in terms of well, how do they make their decisions and what kind of public input is there? Oh, they did that five years ago. Yeah. Right. So that that was done right with the Tiger teams. Um, we could spend a lot of time talking about that. So tell you what, why don't we why don't we put that one in the parking lot and come back to it? <laughs> yes, sir. Is there a harvest season? Or are you so it used season? to be that. People would say only eat oysters in months with R, right? So I interpret that to be R means in 2022 refrigeration, right? So our, our months <laughs> our months are cooler, right? So think back to 1910. You've got an oyster dredge in the in the Delaware Bay under sale, um, but the mirror wall, for instance, right? Isn't that the one, right? And and what do they do with those oysters? They bring them up out of the bottom. They throw them on the deck. And they might put them in the hold if the hold's not full. If you do that in November or December, no problem. Do that in August or July, it's a big issue, right? You're gonna kill a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about the air temperature, temperature not the water temperature, the month with R, it's more about air temperature? Yeah, that's the way I interpret it. It's really about what happens with the product after it comes out of the water. Out of the water. Okay. Yeah. How it's stored, how it's handled, which, you know, we have very strict guidelines. So an oyster right out of warm water, I'd eat one. I've eaten them in the summertime, sure. Yeah. I guess my question was more does Denrec have a season that you're only allowed to harvest them? No, so these are these are captively grown oysters. We can harvest them whenever we want at any size. Okay. Any size we think the market will accept. Uh, yes, sir. I always heard that the uh, month with the R is just a lime scale. That the, if you eat an oyster in a month and not an oyster, it's a little more milky than so that, that's, that can be true with, so there are different ways that oysters are bred and kind of manipulated, not, not spliced with CRISPR, but genetically manipulated. 
so that we create triploid oysters now uh, that don't want to breed, so they don't put any en energy into, well, they can't breed, uh, so they don't put any energy into reproduction so the meat stay firmer and, and better than, than the before oysters. So, um, yeah, that's, that's about it. I mean, the only other kind of, like I was saying, the, the, the big questions are, can we get enough critical mass to, to build the industry? There's, there's infrastructure needs that we've got coming along. Um, we're gonna need more growers. We're gonna need to, to be able to, to have a product that is recognizable regionally and nationally. And, and I think that, I think that I mean, you, you said it, Rehoboth Bay oysters are some of the best. You, I put them up against anybody in the world, honestly. And I think we'll come out on top, nine times out of 10, depending on what your flavor preferences are. But they really are that good, so yeah. I think that's all I've got. Okay. Here's our next slide. No samples? Yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we harvested today, and I, I didn't think there were going to be that many people. <laughs> um, you know, it was, it was, uh, like Ed said, I mean, four people in a, in a meeting room wasn't unusual. So. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. I guess for all three, how concerned are you about all the development going on along the shores of the inland bays right yeah. now? You know, whenever you have. Um, more development, you you get more marinas come in, and if you get marinas, that can contribute to closure areas. Although I can't say that I can document a case now where a new marina has come in and closed down previously open shellfish harvesting areas. They're probably just coming into areas that were already closed or seasonally closed because of other marinas. Um, you know, the more people that you have, the more wastewater that you have, but if your wastewater treatment systems are properly maintained, uh, that shouldn't be an issue. You all are probably remembering, gosh, what was it over the winter, right? We had a, we had a spill up in Lewis and it closed down the whole Rehoboth Bay for 20, 21 days, and it came in January. Wasn't it January when it came? And if it would have been in December, you know, that would have been terrible. You know, just terrible for the growers. So I think, you know, it's a really good question that you asked, but really what we need to be doing is making sure that we're investing in our wastewater treatment infrastructure and making sure it's top notch and not having any chances of spills. So from my point of view, that question is, is twofold. One is um, the, the water quality issues change from agriculturally based to urban based. Um, which is more manageable? I don't know that anybody's got an answer for that. Mm -hmm. The other issue is on the, on the grower side is that the cost of doing business, finding a place to berth your boat, finding a place to offload oysters, you know, little shuck houses on the, on the bay shore, you can't find it. There's no way, right? There's no way that this industry can, can afford that. That's why I was saying we need that critical mass to be able to put together enough people that, that we can afford something because, you, I mean, you know what, what's, what real estate costs, pay side real estate costs. It drives up the cost of waterfront, which yeah. you need to operate. Yeah. I mean, there's, it, the Rehoboth Bay has no such thing as working waterfront, right? Right. Uh, not, like <coughs> you, not like you might see in Long Island Sound or, or somewhere else, the Chesapeake. Question I, in I the back. I expand on that. I think that's a great point that you brought that up. And working waterfronts are endangered in the United States up and down the coast. And it's something that when you think about what is the role of the state in this industry, that is another potential role to identify areas that could serve as joint working waterfronts. And if you go down in Virginia, like on the peninsula in Virginia, you see those waterfronts are down there. And that's something that you know we probably ought to start thinking more about as things are happening so rapidly with development here. Question in the back. Well, this is the hidden question that nobody's saying. How is all this going to get funded? <laughs> it, it's funded by growers. It's funded, it's funded by the industry. Guys like me and Mark Casey going out there and busting. But they're not the funding that hatchery. Yeah, so the hatchery itself was funded through the General Assembly, uh, luckily a $200,000 award to construct a pilot scale facility. We do not have funds identified for a larger fisheries aquaculture innovation center. That is the blunt truth. Um, my colleagues and I are aggressively trying to seek out ideas for funding. So if you have any ideas, I'm here. So 
Sorry, I didn't understand your question. I was, I was looking at it. No, that's okay. I mean, you know, this, this, it's all fabulous and all needed. I mean, I've been talking about, you know, I come from an area in Frederick County, Maryland, where we have a huge uh, program for farm preservation. You know, there needs to be what you were just talking about, a program that helps fund uh, aquaculture areas that will remain those areas instead of, you know, there's a lot that has to go on. Well, what, that's what the leasing areas are for. You right? need to tell your state representatives that. I'm just saying, if the state of Delaware to do this, you've got to talk to your representatives and you can get it because it's there, I know. Right? Well, we, I, uh, I have been talking with uh, Ed and, and uh, Rick. We, so you, you've got this half year small one, and I, my suggestion is in this, this coming bond bill that we put a few money to go toward the feasibility study to do a larger facility, you know, start start working for, towards that. But uh, you've got the pilot here, but I, I think the next step is to you know, have something larger too. So, but you need the feasibility, and it's going to take some time. So I'm I'm, I'm trying to do that this, this in the next month or so. And I'm looking forward to working with Ed and, uh, and, and uh, Dennis. Some conversations a couple weeks ago about this. So. Yes, sir. Yep. So, so the other thing is talking about numbers and, and Mark, what do you think? I think that I think that you could easily have an industry that's harvesting half a half a million oysters a week out of Rowett Bay if all, all all the leases were occupied. Yeah, I mean a simple math is if you could do <coughs> the 300 acres times 50,000 oysters a year, right. right? Which is a small farm. Right now we're required to plant 100,000. That's a, a much bigger number. And we now can export. So we can export out of the state, and we can actually are close now to being able to export out of the country. So the potential here for farming and industry is a very, very large number. Um, it's being able to get people in, that little baby step. And if you can't get in a baby step, and you can't try it and learn then you're never going to be able to evolve. And it's, you know, it's take a baby step first. There's a reason that saves there. Right now, we're struggling with that. Well, I wanted to add to Ron Gray's um, statement. We had an email, our group, as we were planning, from um, Senator Stephanie Hansen, who, who chairs the uh, Senate's um, Environment and Energy Committee. And she said she is fully supportive of this effort. So now, as Ron was saying, we need to begin to plan for the next level. We have one more question in the back, and then we'll wrap it up. Yes, and I think one thing that is going to go hand in hand with this entire conversation, because really we're, we're trying to create economy, viable economy, save the waterways, increase the uh, quality of life, is affordable housing. You mentioned labor is your highest cost. Um, my daughter is graduating from the University of Delaware. And graduates in May, and I was uh, an organic microgreens grower and sold to many restaurants here in Delaware. We're both being forced out of the state. She's applying for jobs out of state because we can't afford housing. Does she want to grow oysters? <laughs> <laughs> she would love to grow oysters if she could afford to live here. So it's a, that is going to become more and more hand in hand issue. We all like to go to restaurants and eat our oysters. It's so all interconnected. This, it's, a big, big it's all interconnected, and we're still at the at the you know a lower level in, in building all of this, but we're getting there. Last question: Are are there ways for us to get involved as volunteers? Talk to your representatives, <laughs> the senators, um, and if you know anybody of influence, I mean. You know, if, you, if you're an employee of the University of Delaware, you don't advocate, you don't seek funding on your own. It goes through the organization. Yeah. So if you know anybody at the University of Delaware or at Delaware State University, tell them, please look into this and support this because it benefits our economy, it benefits our inland bays, um, and, it, and it benefits our people. Please make sure you get one of these handouts. It has some contact information on the back. Um, Mr. 
Chamberlain, final closing uh, statement? Well, you have a closing statement, I think. So Wait, I got one. Oh. <laughs> but no, seriously, I've got, I've, if anybody is interested in, in growing or learning to grow, just give us a call. We'd be happy to show you the ropes and talk about it. So and, and if you have questions, um, um, Ed and Dennis's info is on the back of the flyer. Um, uh, yeah, I just, I just want to, uh, maybe some of you are wondering how this evolves. It's been about a year and a half, and our little group of five, have been pursuing this for uh, the benefits of water quality, uh, of aquaculture, and the General Assembly has been amazing. They've been approached twice, just like that, $100,000 each time. We have uh, inquiries from Senator Carper. Uh, Amy has reached out. Remember, they want a meeting with us. Um, a representative of uh, Blount Rochester's office is, yes. is, has contacted so, us. It's going to take a lot of money, though. I mean, this $200,000 that we were given by the legislature yeah. is a start. It's a start. And Ed calls it a proven hatchery. But we're not done. We are not done. And this is why a meeting like this is so important, because the word is now getting out. We need your help. This is, again, this is a grassroots effort. Anything you can do, reach out to anyone, reach out to us. You know, we're not great. Mimi and I are not, well, Mimi has had a lot of experience writing grants. Ed and Dennis have written many grants. Some get accepted, some get rejected. But uh, the goal, the goal is this FAIC Center. And it may take some time, but the more people raise their voices in this, the sooner it it's a win, win, win for the base. It is a win, win, win. So thank you all for coming. Um, <laughs>